Welcome back to the Financial Shepherd Podcast. My name is Joshua Casey Garland, Certified Financial Planning Professional, owner of Shepherd Wealth Management, founder and CEO of Shepherd Wealth Management, I should say. And uh, glad to be back in studios here, Ez. Uh, we just wrapped up a fantastic Q1. Um, very excited to be doing quarterly reviews. All right. It's already uh, happening right now as we stand. Um, and of course, we just wrapped up March Madness. Now we got baseball season kicking off, which is my favorite sport, even though my, uh, my hometown Red Legs here got off to a good start. We'll see what they do this year. Um, not counting on winning a World Series by any means, but uh, being a little bit more competitive would be great. But uh, yeah, I don't know what, uh, what uh, your thoughts of the first quarter of the year are as, uh, but now that college basketball is over, I assume that you're just focused on the NBA right now. Yeah, that was my security blanket. My comfort, you know, was was March Madness the last, well, you know, began in March. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are in April. Uh, yeah, everybody who watches the show know, you know, big time NBA fan. Love live baseball. Yeah. I'd say that's, even though maybe basketball is my favorite sport, mm. There's, I maybe would prefer to go to a baseball game. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to doing that, hopefully with you uh, this season. Uh, those red leg tickets are going to be pretty cheap. Should be. But you're right. Now that Q1 is over, we left that in the dust and uh, kind of know a little bit what we're up against with the Powell. Uh, the NBA is what I'm surrounding myself with now. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good little, good distraction for me is sports. Yeah. Same here. Um, obviously, family, kids, I uh, have a lot of fun. My youngest is in Taekwondo. My oldest is you know, doing the cheerleading thing and so forth. So. Oh, that's awesome. um, yeah, looking forward to this weekend. We got a big holiday weekend coming up here. We got Easter, people celebrating that weekend, Passover, or just, you know, enjoying time off um, in general. So very excited about the weekend ahead of us here. Might play a little golf if weather permits. And uh, yeah, just overall um, not having to work on Friday, at least not from a trading standpoint. I'm sure I'll be doing something, but markets being closed Friday. Big, uh, big news coming out on Friday as well. So we got uh, employment reports coming out, uh, average hourly wages coming out. These are all very, very important metrics that the market's going to be paying attention to, even though they can't do anything about it until Monday. And uh, that leaves me to uh, probably have to work (laughs) (laughs) either, depending on the data. Uh, that Friday or certainly that weekend. So um, again, we wrapped up a great Q1. Um, Mark has done fantastic, led by the, the tech sector, which we're heavily positioned in for all those that have been watching the show. We remain in that position. We're going to talk a lot about really uh, fun uh, topics today, I think. Um, but before we get into all that stuff, those that may be catching the show for the very first time, uh, again, my name is Joshua Casey Garwin, founder and CEO of Shepherd Wealth Management. I'm a certified financial planning professional. And uh, the reason why we do the show is because uh, I know, you know, my clients watch the news. Yeah. I got the news on all the time and clients watch the news throughout the day on their phones, et cetera, while they're working and traveling around, what have you, catch on the radio, whatever. <clears throat> and the news does a good job of being news, which is placating to, you know, headline events, which is typically driving directly at what what every human being is hardwired with, which is just this emotion of fear and greed, this fight or flight, if you will. Yeah. Right. But what we do know about human beings is what's the money and their emotions, fear and greed. Uh, thanks to the study of behavioral finance, um, human beings actually feel losses twice as much as they feel good about making money. And that's why people tend to watch shows like CNBC and Fox News, CNN, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because it grabs a hold of that, whether it's the fear, the greed part of it, it kind of grabs a hold of it and then it starts to really have an impact on how we make decisions. And I'm not knocking the news. The news is doing its job. My point is the whole point of the show is not to say here's what's going on and why, but also give you some historical perspective uh, because history does seem to repeat itself. But the famously said the one thing we know for sure about human beings is they do not learn from history. I am here to provide that historical context. And the reason why I think that's so important is now it gives you a, uh, a game plan for how to prepare yourself for the next three, six, nine, 12 months as well as the portfolio's asset allocation. So that's the reason why we do this uh, particular show. Asset allocation is just a fancy way of saying this is how much of your money, Ezra, is in stocks, bonds, cash, crypto, whatever. Yeah. The cool part about that is, is we're in full control over the allocation. We could sit here all day. I mean, we all know what the headline news is, 40 year high inflation, uh, the Fed's going to break the market. We got this financial crisis, geopolitical risk, 
I can go on and on. If, um, inflation is going to stay stubbornly high. Earnings are going to fall off a cliff. This is going to be worse than 2008. I mean, I can go on and on. There's more bears out there um, than actual real life bears. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So you put that in perspective. Yeah. I don't know how many actual bears there are. Oh, there, man, but, that'd be a great pub trivia. How right? many bears? Just every kind of bear yeah well i mean you don't have to I mean, it's funny to say that and it's kind of it just kind of came to me there but yeah um and those of you that don't get the behind the scenes of this show i am in tune to this stuff so much i have like two bullet points here of stuff i want to make sure yeah talk about. I'm, I'm looking at joshua's <laughs> notes right now and it's it's <laughs> not even like an eighth of a this page. is just this is a way for two things a lot of fun for me i hope viewers get a lot of educational information i've got a lot of really good feedback from uh from not just clients, but people that aren't clients and like to tune into the show. Um, it's a lot of fun for me. Also, it gives me a way to vent. Yeah. You know, the, the title of today's show, by the way, I loved it. Uh, Barely Legal, B-E-A-R-L-Y. Yeah. I mean, back to this whole <laughs> <Yeah>. mask of bears. <laughs> <laughs> and it has nothing, this has nothing to do with Stormy Daniels, by the way, the Barely no. Legal title. Well, as we've said many times today, she was a, an adult. Yeah. So. And uh, yeah, so I mean, it's just, if you look at the data, there's more bearish positioning, just so much money and cash, even more so than the great financial crisis of 2008. You haven't seen this much cash next to people's portfolio from a retail perspective. This is all coming from Bank of America, by the way. Um, you know, you just haven't seen anything like that since 2004. So wow. I go back quite a ways. And that's why I love doing the show is because if you were to just look at headline news, uh-huh. you would have no freaking idea that the S&P 500 is actually greater than 7% positive so far this year. And you certainly wouldn't know that the NASDAQ, the tech sector, which is the biggest sector by a long shot of all 11 sectors in the S&P 500, being up more than 15% year to date. So we're gonna talk a lot about this stuff here today. And investors are cautious heading into Good Friday, this Friday, um, because they're trying to determine, in my view, and this is the main topic of today's program, did the Fed break the economy or did they break the back of inflation? So that's what I want to start today's conversation with. And then we're going to transition that um, into how it affects you individuals um, that are watching the show or, or clients that are, are investing here um, at Shepherd Wealth Management. <clears throat> All right. So. Investors believe, if you were to just look at, you know, the Bank of America survey that I just referenced there, investors believe that the economy's broke post the Silicon Valley bank crisis. And the vast majority of clients or prospects that I talk to are, you know, obviously they feel nervous. Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, still internal feelings in a negative way relative to 2008. And obviously that was, that was the worst event in the stock market since 1929. Um, so statistically, this is not supposed to happen that often, although a lot of people, again, are positioned that way as, as if this is going to be, you know, a super hard landing and this is going to be worse than 2008. I'll give you my opinion on that here in just a second, but let's, let's get into the numbers a little bit. Arguably, in my view, the make or break view of this question, did the Fed break the economy or did they break the back of inflation? I believe my argument is we'll know here. Uh, this earnings season beginning on April 14th when JP Morgan makes their announcement for Q1 2023 earnings and every other institution across the S&P 500 over the next four or five weeks after that will be making their earnings announcement. I think that if earnings hold up, uh, I believe that they will, then we can easily say, okay, the answer to the question is the Fed broke back inflation, which is a great thing for equities, of course. If earnings per share just completely falls off a cliff, like a lot of pundits may be calling for, um, then obviously we have to change our perspective a little bit on uh, the weightings that we have for clients and their asset allocation. Yeah. However, um, I would say that over the past six months, earnings per share expectations have fallen, which is not a bad thing coming out of 2022. Uh, but seven of the 11 major sectors being communication services, industrials, which I like a lot, uh, materials, healthcare, staples, and to some extent, technology and utilities, uh, they're only falling. I mean, really, the only thing that's holding the market back here recently is, is uh, energy and financials. Now, energy is kind of taking a completely 
complete, you know, turn here. Uh, yeah. Price of barrel was like $65 or somewhere in that area just a couple of days ago. OPEC plus, which is, you know, funny acronym. Um, essentially they control the supply and demand of oil. Almost sounds like a streaming service. Yeah, it does. <laughs> That's the ad free version of OPEC. Yeah. <laughs> so it's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Even with ad free. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so. And you're still getting sold to the whole time. Well, I mean, it, you know, you went from 60s to over $80 a barrel for price of oil. Um, so you're seeing a little pop in energy stocks here over the last two days. But financials, for obvious reasons, have uh, taken the shorts pretty hard post the Silicon Valley Bank. And I don't think that. The majority of the market is positioned so heavily in cash because they think it's going to be a 2008. I think the majority of the market is heavily in cash because they're concerned that the Fed won't um, heed to actual data going on in the marketplace um, and actually force us into some sort of recession. Again, I have some thoughts on that here in just a little bit. However, as I mentioned, straight start to 2023 from a stock perspective. We here at um, Shepherd Wealth Management for our clients that are looking for growth, their, their goal is to try to long term do a little bit better than the overall S&P 500, better than the market. Uh, we thought October 12th, 2022 was the, the low for the year. Uh, inflation started to roll over, therefore we got very heavily positioned into the tech sector, uh, even more so than we already were allocated and certainly benefited from that. Now, stocks have been resilient in the face of all these fundamental quote unquote bear catalysts, such as the Federal Reserve hikes over 500 basis points. That's more than 5% in 12 months. Oil surges over $100 a barrel with the uh, geopolitical risk in Ukraine uh, caused by the Russian invasion. Inflation surges more than 9% in 2022. Regional bank crisis erupts in 24 hours and yet Stocks have managed to gain, as I mentioned at the top of the program here, 7% year to date in the S&P 500. The FANG stocks, so the, big, yeah, the big ones. Yeah, um, I thought we were saying MANG now. <laughs> I guess Facebook, got, yeah, I get that. Um, <laughs> over over 30% to the positive, right, for those big name, big name stocks that got hammered in 2022. And then tech as a sector got hammered, pretty much the worst sector of the S&P 500 for sure. But that so far this year has done better than 15%, as I mentioned, at the top of the show, in, in spite of all of these quote unquote bear catalysts. So it may be, in my view, that the Q1 2023 earnings season, which happens here in April, as I mentioned, JP Morgan is kicking us off on the 14th of April. That's going to be the final capitulatory event. I mean, that's really kind of, in my view, the last leg that the bears have to stand on. Yeah. Is well, earnings or earnings expectations are too high. Um, you're seeing the data for inflation. I don't care what number you look at, CPI, the PPI, the core services, X housing. Um, you can break it down however you want to. There's inflation is rolling over. The uh, consumer expectations on inflation are significantly lower. And you don't have to look any farther than the bond market. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in February, we were talking about interest rates or the Fed taking their Fed funds rates north of six percent. You saw the two-year climb over five percent. The ten-year was, you know, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And yeah. then we get the Silicon Valley Bank thing happen in, in, in early March. That changed everybody's expectations on inflation overnight because. If you don't need to be a, a PhD in economics to understand that when there's that sort of uh, uncertainty in the banking system, after having raised rates more than they've ever raised them in the history of mankind, yeah. really six months. Historical. Definitely historical. Um, the Fed even admitted the fact that that in and of itself, that, that event with Silicon Valley Bank is going to cause credit lending to tighten. And that's the same thing as the Fed actually increasing interest rates. The difficult part about that is when credit tightens just due to the what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, you can't really accurately say, OK, that's that's equivalent to a 50 basis point hike as the, uh, for the Fed were done or a 75 basis point hike. You don't really know until the data starts to come out. And on top of all of that, you've got these long lagging effects from increasing rates so much. Um, you're seeing not only numbers on inflation roll over before Silicon Valley Bank, they're certainly going to do it after. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. But on top of that, you got the bank actually tightening their credit lending. Um, so this is, in fact, all deflationary. 
And I think the majority of investors, definitely my clients and definitely myself, felt like coming into this year, the major risk was inflation. Yeah. Is inflation going to stay sticky? Is it going to uh, come back uh, in an upward manner, meaning inflation is now going up? Uh, or, in fact, are we able to actually have a wrangle on inflation here with what the Fed's already done, plus what the banks are now getting ready to do? But I really think that the capitulatory event that would have to change my view, uh, my bullish view, I'm one of the few bulls out here in the marketplace for sure. Um, I have won so far, by the way. Um, we'll get into some data here that really points to you know history saying that I'm probably still right. <laughs> However, I've been right and wrong at the same time in the same day. Um, oh, yeah. That in part of podcast as well. So everybody stay tuned. Now, I, I do want to spend a minute here on what the Fed calls super core inflation. So what is super core inflation uh, metric? It's core services X housing. That's what they've that's what they've hung their hat on as a reason to raise rates, even though Silicon Valley Bank failed, right? Bank right. failure, bank failure, uh, a lot of uncertainty in the market, Fed decided to raise rates anymore. Sounds kind of dumb to me, especially since it takes 12 to 18 months for that interest rate hike to actually impact the markets. Yeah. Pretty stupid, in my opinion. That's what they did. Now, if the Fed's hanging their hat on the fact that this core services X housing metric is where they see sticky inflation, that's why they're so honed in on it. Um, they wanted to see that come down to around their historical averages. Now, the historical average, if you look at the 65-year historical average um, for core services X housing inflation, is right about 4%. The 45-year average is 3.1. We just got the news on March 31st, core services X housing came in at 3.3%. Wow. So we're there. You get to declare victory on that one too. I don't know why they don't, um, but we're gonna find out here in May all at the same time as we get more and more uh, jobs reports. So we got some pretty cool stuff coming out here from an economic calendar standpoint. I talked about Friday, uh, this week markets are closed. Everybody's going to get the same news at 8.30 in the morning about U.S. employment, unemployment, average hourly wages. Uh, all of these things are going to be super, super important. Nobody's going to be able to do anything until Monday, though. Then we get some wholesale inventory information. But the big news is going to be next week on Wednesday, February 12th, we get the CPI number again. Mm. Uh, on Thursday, April the 13th, we get the PPI, the Producer Price Index. And on Friday, April the 14th, you're going to get some retail sales numbers, um, things of that nature. So next week is very, very important. I think that's why the market's being a little cautious um, leading into this Friday, being, again, a market holiday, being a good Friday. The day has been great, but yet you still get the Fed heads, as I call them. Uh, today, you had Loretta Mester coming out and saying, yeah, I think we still need to increase rates. I wish they would give you some actual reasons for that. Yeah. As opposed to saying, eh, let's see, finger in the wind. Yeah. Still blowing like we need to increase interest rates here. It's almost like they're trying to make you flinch, you know, like that jock in the hallway in high school. That's like, because <laughs> that is where I was going. It's like you read my mind. It's like, <laughs> it's like they want to be, um, they want to talk this, you know, tough talk, if you will, to try to keep a lid on what I believe would otherwise be a pretty awesome accelerated movement to the upside here in April. We're probably still running it anyway. I believe the data is going to come in exactly the way the Fed actually wants it to come in, which is lower inflation. You haven't completely crushed the job market just yet. And you still got the uh, financial sector tightening credit, which is the same thing as increasing interest rates. Yeah. Which to me means if you want to stay higher for longer, great. Stay there for a little bit. Look around, see what happens. And continue to watch inflation fall, by the way, as opposed to saying, yeah, we got to increase rates. And the only reason why they're saying that is because they, they probably don't want to see the market rip up into the right before they get more data, which is going to come out freaking next week. So we'll see. We'll get the data and we'll see how real data dependent uh, these Fed heads actually are. Now, the other thing uh, that came in really positively, not just for the Fed, but really should have been for the market. And I have a, a little bone to pick with the market on this one, at least today. Is, is that we would argue that yesterday's jobs report, the jolts, 
um, that was also going in the Fed's favor. And that's another reason for fewer rate hikes. Uh -huh. The JOLTS report came in about 630,000 fewer jobs, uh, job openings uh, from the prior month. So the job openings came in from February, uh, 9 million. 930,000 uh, 930, versus the street estimate of 10.5. So pretty good drop off there. And prior to that, job openings were nearly 11 million. So you're seeing a pretty steep decline. And now we're still above pre-pandemic levels. So again, yet the job market has not been completely crushed by all these interest rate hikes, uh, which is a good thing. What we're also seeing is the job opening to worker ratio. Remember last year, everybody was talking about there's two job openings for the person out there looking for a job, well, that came down as well, which is, again, is a Fed goal. If if they feel like they need to slow down um, services, yeah. well, if there's fewer people that have a job, well, that's 70% of the freaking economy, right? So service information or services inflation is obviously coming down because of that. So these are all, you know, the goal of monetary policy as it relates to bringing down inflation. The bone I have to pick with the market is you got everybody on CNBC and Fox News today or pick your favorite news outlet that follows the stock market. They're like, oh, man, there's there's uh, this ratio of uh, job openings to, to workers. And now we have fewer people. I'm sorry. There's uh, fewer job openings that are out there, so on and so forth, that that would indicate that the economy is being crushed. Again, this is the question the market is trying to determine right now. Did the Fed break the economy or did it just break inflation? Right now, everybody's positioned that the Fed broke the economy. I'm one of those few people out there that are saying the Fed broke inflation. Hmm. Now, as soon as the Fed recognizes they broke inflation, the better for everybody yeah. because it's going to provide some clarity as to what actually um, we need to do from a policy standpoint. And I have a little bit more to talk about that here uh, in just, just a little bit. Additionally, we got ISM manufacturing survey in March. That happened on Monday. That came in exactly where the Fed wanted it to, meaning lower than analyst expectations. Uh, the number came in at 46.3. The street estimate was 47 and a half. The month prior to that, the number came in at 47.7. Again, this is disinflationary data points here. This is the lowest number uh, that we've seen, by the way, since July of 2020. Huh. Um, prices paid slipped be uh, below 50 yet again. So all these metrics are showing signs of disinflation, yet we still have not had any Fed head or specifically Jerome Powell come out and acknowledge this stuff. Uh, I don't know why. Um, if he's serving the American people, and if you're looking at you know things the way that the overall market does, and by the way, the market's the best economist on the planet because it's forward-looking. It's not backward-looking. The Fed's looking at backward-looking data. Right, CPI, the headline number that we're gonna, you know, get next week. That's the first inflation metric that comes out before PPI and then CPE, et cetera. Um, that is giving an equal weight over the last 12 months on inflation. Obviously, inflation in the summertime of last year was exceptionally high. It was 9.1 percent. Oh yeah, right. Leading up to that, inflation kept growing. It peaked out in the summer and then started to fall a little bit. Not dramatically, it's starting to get a little bit more dramatic as we get closer and closer to the end of the year. That CPI metric, the way they calculate it, is giving an equal weight to all of them. So they're looking at backward looking data as opposed to what the market's looking at is forward looking data, which is exactly why you see the two year, which was, you know, again, I think I mentioned this, over 5% just a couple of weeks ago, you get the Silicon Valley bank crisis happen. And um, essentially the two years hanging out around 3.7 at the moment. Yeah. The 10 year is at about 3.27. Um, and the Fed's basically saying, yeah, we're going to take rates over 5%. So there's a pretty big gap there. Um, either the Fed's crazy or the market's crazy. And I gotta believe that the Fed's crazy because if you continue throughout the rest of April, their next meeting's in May. Okay. So we get, we get all the earnings per share information. We will get inflation information, uh, here in April. Fed doesn't talk until May. And April is seasonally an excellent, it's usually the best month uh, from a stock standpoint. And uh, we're trying to benefit from that. But if the Fed decides to increase rates in May, which I'm not calling for, I think they're just going to hang out where they're at right now. 
Maybe they have to cut later on the year. That's to be determined. There's, there's too many variables between now and let's say, you know, the beginning of uh, Q4, uh-huh. right? Where there may or may not be a need to, to cut rates, depending on what actually happens with inflation. But my point being is if the Fed decides to increase rates in March post a financial crisis, if you will, definitely not 2008, but a crisis of sorts, because 64% or so of all commercial real estate is in the regional bank's portfolio. Um, so it's a huge, huge part of the financial system. And if they decide to increase rates in May, after we're probably going to get more disinflationary metrics on employment and inflation, I think they're going to look like complete fools. And if they worry about their credibility, I think that's the reason why they increased rates last time, by the way, because it meant nothing to the market. It did nothing yeah. as it relates to the fight against inflation. They're going to look like morons. And they're probably going to have a bazooka blasted on them from, you know, um, Senator Warren, right? Uh, since he basically grilled Jerome Powell on uh, Capitol Hill there a couple of weeks back. Um, because they're going to cause unemployment, which is unnecessary, right? If you get inflation coming down, yeah. and you're still jacking up rates to kind of bring down the unemployment. The Fed's going to look like they lost complete credibility, uh, which is a bigger problem for the overall market because that's their primary mandate. Yes, price stability, that's inflation. Primary mandate is financial stability. Right. We are the U.S. We are the world currency. We're the biggest economy on the planet. That's your most important job. Um, so he's got to start to recognize a lot of this stuff. But what would be super helpful is he actually articulate that to the American public instead of just sitting on their hands and allowing this debate to go on within uh, the individual investors portfolio. And again, they're trying to answer the question and they don't have all the um, information to come up with a, oh, 100% the Fed broke the economy or 100% they broke inflation. There's this real type of war going on right now. But all the data suggests, as I've read them off here, this is a lot of disinflationary uh, events that are occurring right in front of our eyes. And the bond right. market's calling for it. Interest rates are falling. Uh, but yet we still have this excess level of fear. Yeah. And that's uh, showing up right in the data from Bank of America as far as cash position for retail investors. Well, I mean, one of their big, the the Fed's big concerns recently was that, or maybe not the Fed's, but, you know, you saw that, like, don't do a run on the banks. Your money's safe. And they're trying to reassure everyone that what happened at SVB wasn't going to just be this endemic thing that we got to pull our money out. Right. Mm -hmm. And just back to your point where a little transparency, just a little reasoning even if it's not full on, like here's we're doing X, Y, and Z because of, you know, A, B, and C, I think it would assuage a lot of the fears and people might be more willing to just put up with some of the opacity in other places, you know? Yeah. Uh, I just don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. It's like, instead, they're like, hey, man, you, you got too many calories on that tray. And instead of just explaining why it's good to eat healthy, they just wipe all the tater tots off, which is the best right. part. Right. You know, <laughs> you're just like, come on. I'm with you on that. Like, but I mean, if you just look at the data from this week, I mean, yesterday's jolts, uh, information, uh, the employment information, to me, this is all pointing to that inflation is broke and not the economy. However, earnings per share um, announcements, uh, quarterly earnings announcements that we're about to be getting here, um, beginning April 14th and throughout the remainder of April and into May is going to be a major driver of what the stock market is going to do. Uh, for the remainder of 2023, most likely. So that's what um, our view is, and that's the recent data. Um, another important point here that I wanted to make um, relative to what history would have to say for all of those that are so bearish out there is the S&P 500 has posted two consecutive quarterly gains, which has never, ever happened in a bear market since 1950. And in our view, the first quarter gains in 2023 validate the bull market started in October 12, 2022. And in fact, the S&P has been rising for six months and investors are more bearish now than they were in October 2022, yeah. as I mentioned before. So just in case you were living under a rock <laughs> or a pineapple know, under the sea, yeah, pineapple <laughs> under the sea. Uh, so here are the major reasons for bearish sentiment. 
Inflation was supposed to accelerate in 2023. I just gave you a bunch of reasons and metrics that inflation's about cooling very sharply. Yeah. Earnings per share estimates were supposed to tank. Well, here's a big history lesson for all you guys who are just looking <laughs> at information based on today. The market is forward looking. Okay. First of all, our range per share is coming very nicely, um, relative to what people thought was going to happen here this far. Again, April is going to be big for that. Here's where, here's your, uh, history lesson. And I wrote about this in 2022. So go to shepherdwm.com. You can either check out the, um, newsletter and or the podcast that goes over this specifically. The stock market actually bottoms 11 to 12 months before earnings per share bottom. We got that last year. Yeah. The recession was last year. If you, if they end up calling a recession in 2023 because they couldn't call it that in 2022 because of how historically low, like 60 year plus low unemployment rate, even though we had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, the market was down 20%. I mean, that was the textbook definition. Yeah. 2022 was exactly the textbook definition of a recession other than the employment story, which is again why the Fed's so focused on taking the tots off the train. Craziness. But we got the market at the bottom last year. Again, the market bottoms 11 to 12 months before earnings per share does. Hence, why I believe 2022 was our recession. October was the bottom of the market in 2022. We're actually in a bull market. If they call recession this year, let's say that happens. Um, that would mean that it's a, either a rolling recession, which is kind of what you want to hear or what you're hearing from the pundits. Yeah. Um, the reality is, is it probably won't mean a whole hell of a lot because it's so backward dated, right? If we got inflation coming down and the unemployment rate still staying relatively where it is today, around that three, six to four number, uh -huh. that's fantastic for the market. Now, the problem is, and this is what Elizabeth Warren was yelling at uh, Chairman Jerome Powell about, it's like, if you keep jacking up rates and people get laid off and laid off and we keep getting disinflation information, he doesn't have a tool in his tool belt because he used to freaking word tool belt all the time. Right. There's no tool belt to stop people from firing people. Yeah, it's an axe handle. That's the only thing he has. There's nothing. It's not a tool belt with multiple right. things. And by the way, I'm not a political guy. This isn't a political show. I cannot think of one other thing that me and Elizabeth Warren agree on, but we agree on this one. So. Well, that's a political statement. So let's get focused. We're focused. <laughs> no, I'm, all right. just, I'm just messing with you. Man. No, number three. Number three <laughs> reason for all the bears out there. Regional banking crisis was supposed to tank the economy. It did it. Right. Definitely did not. Now, I do think there is a risk here in the regional banking sector. I mentioned this before, over 60% of commercial real estate is in their portfolio. Plus, they have the same sort of bond uh, portfolio, hopefully not as long in uh, maturity as to what company like bank did. So they're sitting on a bunch of paper losses on their bond holdings as well because of all the massive interest rate increases that we've seen. So it did not cause uh, the economy to tank, certainly not 2008. Um, but we have to keep an eye on that because if the Fed wants to keep jacking our rates, then that, that could bring something else. Hmm. So I, I admit that that is a real risk in the marketplace there. Again, this is all in the hands of the Fed though. Yeah. Right. They can control all of this stuff. Uh, they just need to wake up and step in the shoes of Main Street. Instead of in their ivory tower, it's almost like yeah. Despite the fact that they work for us, they're not. Amazing. They're not amazing. Uh, it almost sounds like everybody in Washington, but <laughs> yeah. Even though they're supposedly a completely separate, supposedly entity. hired by us, they're not working for us. Hmm. Well, again, this is giving the Bears ammunition, right? Yeah, I hear you, but the data says something else, and that's exactly what the market's looking at right now. It's looking past. All this stuff here and now is saying, well, what is this going to look like six, nine, 12 months from now based on actual economic data, the CPI, the PPI, all the stuff that we just wrote off their jobs report, PCP, it's all coming in the direction of disinflation. Number four, the Fed was supposed to become more hawkish. Well, remember when they talked about rates being over 6% in 2023, just a few weeks ago? Rates are actually falling fast at bond market mature, the proof of that. Long-term yields were supposed to soar, but have fallen consistently since February. I just mentioned the 10 years now continuing to fall is at 3.2%. In other words, various catalysts have come and gone, and the S&P 500 is still up 7% year-to-date. Well, I guess the next question would be logically, what about April, you may ask? Well, we expect April here at Shepherd Wolf Management to be the strongest month of 2023. Um, that has a lot to do with the numbers that I just wrote off, but from a historical standpoint, April generally, 
the third year of a president uh, being in office is generally the best um, month of that president's four-year term. And history would have to say that April is just seasonally a really strong month because yeah. you're getting Q1 data that typically has some tailwinds coming from Q4, which is generally the best whole quarter hmm. of the year. Now, that's one of the reasons why we're still bullish, but additional history lesson. Again, this show is not just about telling you what happened here in the news recently, but what does history have to say about similar events? So we got off to an awesome January. We got off to a great quarter. January was awesome. February sucked. March was awesome in the face of a Silicon Valley bank. 16th largest bank in the country, by the way, failing. Um, if you look at all of history, Coming out of a year where we had negative returns in the S&P 500. Yeah. Right? So that was last year, 2022. The first five trading days, the fir- if the first five trading days are greater than 1.4% positive performance in the S&P 500, um, well, that's only happened seven times since 1950. That happened in 58, 63, 67, 75, 2003, 2012, and 2019. And based upon those seven years, April has an implied gain, a median return of 4.2%. Uh, and that's been positive six of seven times. The only time it was negative was in 2012. April was down point, uh, negative 0.7%, which is not that much. So this would imply a plus 175 point addition to the S&P 500, which would put the index right around 42.75 by the end of April. Huh. So that's kind of what we're expecting here. And this is, again, based on what history would have to say. Um, and going back to the first five trading days when the S&P is greater than 1.4%, um, again, that's only happened uh, about seven times. Now, if history is going to repeat itself, which is important in our view, because Buffett, um, I think Warren Buffett, everybody would agree, is probably the best investor in our generation, if not in all time. 65 plus years of doing it and doing two times better than the S&P 500 uh, will put you in some rarefied air. Oh, yeah. The, uh, when when uh, Buffett was asked, what's the number one risk that individual investors have? He said themselves. The follow up question was, well, why is that? He said, one thing we know about human beings for sure is they do not learn from history. Right. The market's made up of a bunch of human beings. We haven't changed in over 2000 plus years. And history tends to repeat itself. Now, clearly, past performance is not a guarantee of future results uh, for the compliance people that are watching the show. Um, History tends to repeat itself, specifically in the market, because human beings are so emotional and so predictable over time. In the short term, it's kind of like a coin flip just because of all the emotional aspects of sentiment uh, that individual investors have about whatever the headline news is. But the fact of the matter is, I think all these bears sitting in cash or cash related types of investment instruments, they're probably just waiting for, you know, the ability to say, oh, man, I told you so. I was right in 2022. 2023 is not going to be different. It might even be worse. Um, but by the time they actually catch on to the actual bull market that's taking place right in front of them, again, assuming earnings come in fine, which I believe they will. And assuming the Fed actually takes the medicine and looks around and says, actually, the data is going the way we were kind of hoping it would based on all the monetary policy decisions. I don't know why they don't want to say that. Like, that's a win. Yeah. That's a Fed in your cap. Like, oh, yeah, we did all this crap. It was painful. But look, employment is still pretty good. Inflation is coming down. Yeah. Go for the uh, market. You're now free to take off. Into the right. I think that's what people are waiting to hear. You're not going to freaking hear that. And by the time you decide to go dip your toe into stocks again, you're going to be too late. Too late. You missed the boat. That's why market timing doesn't work. And that's why it's important to understand what history has to say. Um, otherwise, I, I guarantee you, there isn't a client or a prospect that I will talk to the remainder of this coming quarter between you know now and the end of this quarter that would have any idea what this rule of first five trading days is. They would have no idea that this happened seven other times. They would probably also have no idea that we've never actually had a bear market when the S&P 500 has had two consecutive quarters of positive returns. Welcome to my show. This is why we do this. <laughs> Welcome to this reality. This is what we do. Okay. Um, additionally, the big risk coming into 2023 in our view is the Federal Reserve will over tighten the monetary, monetary policy and cause a dramatic recession. However, the February PCE deflator, which is the super core services X housing, again, came in at 0.27%. 
This is the lowest since July of 2022. The annualized rate came in at 3.3. I think we talked about this at the beginning of the show, right, Ez? Yeah, we did. It's right in line with what they're looking for. And it's, that's the thing that they're spending the most time talking about is core services, X housing. Yeah. You got it. Why don't you just say, hey, guys, we got it. We did it. Yeah. That's a good thing. Um, however, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's Cadillac Margarita time. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we're not hearing that. Yeah. And if you look at, again, the labor from the JOLS report, um, still looks very strong labor market. Uh, however, it is, in fact, coming down, which is exactly what the Fed's monetary policy was geared to do. So that's what's going on. There's your history lesson. We are positioning ourselves here at Shepherd Wealth Management. Um, when you have easing financial conditions, easing financial conditions would mean rates are coming down. You're seeing deflation um, without the labor market being completely destroyed. Um, easing financial conditions, what's correlated with that? Well, 88% of the tech sector is highly correlated mm -hmm. with easing financial conditions. That's the reason why it's done so well, y'all. Yeah. What also does good? Industrials. Typically does fairly well. Small caps will do well. Uh, small caps are getting crushed right now just because that's a big part of the small cap space is a bunch of smaller regional banks. Uh, so taking on the chin right now typically does well. Energy will probably likely do well just because of all the OPEC plus cuts uh, that we saw China's coming back to real world, um, you know, opening up their entire country, which by the way, I think people forgot because China was in a, you know, in an apartment, more or less, for three years. <laughs> um, that's 20% of the global GDP. All, uh, all bullish signs, in our view. Now, I want to shift gears here a little bit, because we talked about a lot of concerns. Or what is it that concerns a lot of individuals, right? Well, I like to do this little research project at the beginning of the year. I've done it for a long, long time now, and I'll continue to do it. Because this is the main reason why... I love my job, love doing it. Um, it's really to help other people, and here's why. So this is coming from the American Psychiatric Association, all right? Uh -huh. Americans coming into 2023 said, 64% of them said anyway, the thing that keeps them up at night, keeps them very anxious, concerned, and nervous is their personal financial situation. That's the number one thing, 64%. That's up from 58% last year. The second thing that kept them up at night, very anxious and nervous about, was the uncertainty of 2023. Hmm. Now, I, I can tell you all the factual information, the historical information as it relates to why that uncertainty for 2023 probably shouldn't be as high on this list. I understand why it's second, though, because you got a lot of people that are making these decisions that started to say, well, we're data dependent. Well, now the data is saying you guys are winning the war here. Uh, against inflation, you haven't completely destroyed the job market, all of these good things with your monetary policy tool, uh, but then, yet they feel like they're helping to take it to another level that the market's saying that's unnecessary. Yeah. Right? I get the concern there. I can't solve that problem today. I can just give you the factual uh, historical data. I can point to the market, you know, kind of agreeing with all the things that I'm talking about here. Um, the personal financial situation now, 64% of Americans saying that's the number one stress in life. I actually looked at a different one too, just so I didn't cherry pick, um, you know, pretty reputable source here, the American Psychiatric Association, pretty good. But Capital One and credit wise, uh, pretty good player, pretty big player in the financial services space. They also did the exact same survey and they had a survey report showing 74% of Americans' number one stress and anxiety in life is a personal financial situation. Now, why is that something that's so important to me? Well, being a certified financial planning professional, that's what I am here to uh, help with in solving those problems. Now, if you just look at the global pandemic, like nobody woke up January you know, 2020 saying, man, I'm really concerned about there being some sort of healthcare crisis that's gonna shut the whole world down. Like nobody woke up and said that. When that happened though, it was amazing for me to watch the, this very complex supply chain, global economy, all this stuff. It just pivoted on a dime. Yeah. Now, what allowed that to happen was the forces of the Federal Reserve and the United States government printing a bunch of money, more than history, causing inflation. Um, but that's really what saved the, the confidence in our financial system, which, by the way, this is the number one mandate for the Fed. That's the whole reason why these guys were freaking creative. That's why they have a job. Mm -hmm. Right. Price stability is one thing. Financial stability is the most important thing. My point being 
is if the Fed, the, the U.S. government, and other central bankers around the world can pivot on a dime that quickly, yeah. what that tells you is money is an endless resource, right? But yet the number one concern for Americans is the richest country on the planet, like the, the largest economy on the planet, the global currency, their number one stress in life is a personal financial situation. Hell, there's so much money, they'll drop it from airplanes, right, if it gets bad enough. I mean, that's basically what we learned from the global pandemic and kind of what we learned from the uh, banking crisis here with Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, they backed up all of the past. They didn't have to do that. But that would have destroyed confidence for our financial system, which is the backbone of what makes this whole big-ass machine work. Yeah. Right? So why is it that individual um, consumers, you know, hardworking Americans, um, the vast majority of them, the thing that keeps them anxious and nervous and concerned at night is their personal financial situation. So how can we help with that? Well, one of the things that I want to point to that I think is just a mistake, and it's not anybody's fault because I'm not blaming Tony Robbins or Dave Ramsey. They're just too simplistic with their advice. Uh -huh. They're always looking at, you know, budget this and cut expenses. Well, clearly, right? I don't think anybody, you know, you need a degree to say, don't have high interest balances on your credit cards. Okay, that's that's a kind of an obvious one. So let's put that aside for a second. There's only so much you can do on, if you have, everybody has a personal income statement, right? You have cash flow at the top, revenue for the household or individual, and then all the expenses. And then what you have left is hopefully savings, vacations, homes, whatever. Yeah. There's only so much you can do on that expense side, right? You still got to eat, you still got to pay for your utilities, you still got to have a car, most places, and you need some place to live, right? Not a lot of stuff you can do. You can cut your Netflix subscription if you want to, you know, for all those that have a uh, gym membership they're not going to, they'll all eventually get cut out at some point in time. But people spend so much of their time and energy on, well, what can I do with my budget to maybe clear out another 30 bucks a month, right? I spend maybe 5% of my time on the uh, expense side of my personal balance sheet. Uh -huh. I spend the majority of my time focusing on the top line, the revenue line. Mm. Why is that? Again, not only can I not cut that many things out of my expense budget, and I've already done that to the best of my ability, but everybody has a talent of some way, shape, or form. There is something that everybody's good at. That's what their job is, whatever it is, customer service, making things, um, whatever. Now you have a, let's say a job paycheck every two weeks, um, doing whatever it is that you're talented at. And that talent can probably be utilized in another way to generate another stream of income. Now, some people will say, well, I'll just go buy real estate. I love real estate. I am a landlord. It's my second favorite thing to invest in. I'm going to spend some time talking about that in more detail on the podcast one day. I'll talk a little bit about it today of why I like it so much, but, um, Oh, there's a lot of people that are making some money selling stuff online. You know, Etsy, um, the Facebook marketplace. You can create a website pretty cheaply these days and sell things online. Of course, there was always the eBay thing, um, so on and so forth. Or some people are just deciding to pick up, you know, doing the Uber drive thing, something. But cash flow is something that you have way more control over than the expense side of that personal income statement. Mm -hmm. Spend your time focusing on what am I good at and how can I scale this? And once you've kind of peaked out scaling it, well, maybe you just peaked out that employer. Maybe you have the ability to actually create your own company doing the thing that you're already doing for an employer anyway. The scary side of that is you don't have that W-2 paycheck coming in every two weeks. Yeah. You don't have the health insurance. And I get all that. I'm going to, I went through all that and still dealing with some of those same fears here today. Um, you know, running the company that I have. Yeah. But I will tell you this, the ability to generate more revenue and help more people uh, is, is far in excess today than it ever was when I was working at TD Ameritrade or Fidelity um, or any other places that I worked at for that matter. So I'm not saying everybody does, you know, should be a business owner and all those sorts of things. My point is, is that if that is you and your primary concern is your personal financial situation, you need to consider how can I increase my top line? We'll do the best we can on the expense side of things. Right. But most people aren't going to say, OK, my home's appreciated value. So I'm going to go sell that and I'm going to take my my wife, my two kids and my two dogs and go from 2000 square feet to an apartment that's 800 square feet. Like 
most people aren't going to take that kind of hit sacrificially, right? Yeah. You want to yeah. stay in one bed and a couch, you know? Probably not going to happen for most people. Yeah, that's either a drastic necessity or just a, a mindset that is unique. Exactly. You can't save your way, you know, to being super successful. And for some people, that definition of success is completely different. Like I know plenty of people that I'm working with right here today with a, uh, what, what some people would consider not even close enough to retire, but their lifestyle is completely different. They're totally cool. They're happy. Yeah. You know what they want to do. They're not financially stressed. They're not going to run out of money. Uh, but there are some people that would say there's no way in hell that you can retire on that amount of money. It's possible depending on lifestyle. And for some people, they need to have a heck of a lot of money to sustain the lifestyle that they're accustomed to all the years that they're working. So the whole point is cash flow. Cash flow is the key to this entire equation about giving yourself financial peace. Um, because the ideal retirement scenario, so I get this question a lot. What's the ideal retirement scenario? I would define the ideal retirement scenario as I wake up in retirement, no job, and I have enough income coming in to cover my lifestyle cost. It has nothing to do with the market, whether it's social security, if that's still around, uh, rental property, um, uh, maybe some people have a pension still, from baby boomer generation, that type of stuff. All of those are inflows that have nothing to do with the stock or the bond market. That's why I want to start the ideal definition of retirement. My lifestyle is covered and it has nothing to do with the market. Therefore, I can be pretty aggressive. Even in retirement, I have clients that are in this situation, 60, 70 plus years old. Uh, there's, there's no way that they could spend all that money because it's not that they have so much uh, relative to a lot of other investors that are out there is because they have so much income coming in to cover all their lifestyle costs, which allows them to be fairly aggressive in the majority of their portfolio. And the last thing I'll talk about from a portfolio standpoint, if your personal financial situation is your number one concern, we talked about cash flow, not spending too much time on expenses, you need to consider concentrating the portfolio investments. Yeah. So you look at you know some of the wealthiest people on the planet, Mark Cuban, Warren Buffett, so on and so forth. Uh-huh. Uh, Cuban would tell you that diversification is for idiots. Buffett specifically said diversification is quote um, important for those who don't know what they're doing. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, if you've got a long time horizon, or if you're one of those you know, older retirees I just described that has so much income, um, you can actually afford to do this for parts of your portfolio. Too. You know, we're 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 doing that for some clients, not maybe for everything, but. Diversification is important if you are completely freaked out about the market and you don't want too much volatility, great. Let's build an asset allocation model that will minimize the volatility and still get you a positive return that keeps up with your lifestyle. That is certainly something we can do. Um, I think a lot of places can solve that problem. That's not a big deal. But for those that have the income and for those that are younger trying to build wealth to get out of this concern of personal finances, if you want to do better than the overall market, you got to take some risks. You don't need to be dumb about it and just like, oh, flip it. I'm going to go buy, you know, Dogecoin or whatever. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing or some people didn't make money. I'm just trying to pick something that has been a super volatile asset. Class. Seems like a meme. Yeah. Or you could just concentrate the portfolio into some of the most highly um, uh, diversified companies and highly profitable companies. What is that? Well, Apple's one of those that would define that. You know, if you look at Google and Amazon and some others, Nvidia, et cetera, um, you don't need, and Buffett would tell you that there's probably only maybe 10 companies of all 500 and the S&P 500 that are worth actually investing in. So why would you want to spend any of your time, energy, and resources investing in your 15th best idea? Yeah. Right? Concentrate that portfolio if you have the time and the risk tolerance from which to do so. Um, that's a big piece of this as well. I think a lot of investors, when I see their 401ks, that's the bulk of people's you know, assets, specifically when they're younger, they don't even know what they're investing in. They have no idea. They, they couldn't tell you what it's investing in, why, what the cost is to hold that. Um, does it actually matching their goals and timeframes or risk tolerance? They couldn't tell you. That's a big reason why I have a job. It's why I love what I do. It's fun. It's easy for me. I get excited about helping people in that way and showing them, you know, there's a, there's a smarter way to go about accomplishing uh, your agenda here. And I, I just have to tell you that every year I see this number take up more and more people that are concerned is their personal financial situation. The government's not going to solve it for you. Don't wait around for that. Um, society is not going to give you a handout, right? When uh, grandma gets sick, you know, 
It's not going to happen. It might sound cool that we're all going to live in unison and harmony, and that's great being peaceful and whatnot, but it's not, uh, you know, it, it sounds good until there's a paycheck that's needed, and then uh, that typically doesn't happen. So I think that this is a problem we're solving. I think this should be talked about more and more. Unfortunately, it's not because the government's giving you all a very bad example of personal finances, giving the 31, $32 trillion worth of budget deficit that we have here. So it looks like um, financial planners across the country are going to be gainful employed <laughs> for the foreseeable future. Um, but in all seriousness, this is something that we're, we're very passionate about solving for folks. It can be done. Um, and you don't have to pay any pension when you do so in most cases. So I really enjoyed this show, as I know that we uh, covered a lot of ground here with the markets, personal finance stuff. Um, anything we need to update or close with before I wrap it up? Yeah, I just want to say how much I appreciate our viewership for hanging on uh, while we had to do round two today. We had some unexperienced... Mm -hmm. uh, Unexpected technical issues, but it looks like we got them solved for the future. So we're, we're happy to be on YouTube live. Uh, we really think it's a great way to not only reach the clients that we have here at Shepherd Wolf Management, but the general public. So if anyone stumbles upon this show live um, or is waiting for it, also sees them on the archive, please leave your questions and comments uh, or hop in the chat and Joshua will answer them. And for our loyal viewers who saw us on our other platform, uh, especially Brian from Shelbyville, we want to give you a shout out. I know we haven't been able to work taking your calls yet, but we're we're getting that in there. So yeah, hang tight. Hit us up, 513-630-2664. Uh, don't forget to check out shepherdwm.com. We post uh, weekly blogs there. Uh, we're putting all of the newsletters that we post. Uh, we're sending out to every client every single month. It's also now going on the website. Um, so don't forget to check that out. And we look forward to doing this again in a couple of weeks. Hope you guys have a great holiday weekend. And uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Have a great rest of your weekend. Take care.